So continuing from before, we now go into several types of research methods or major research designs in sociology. This will be the survey, ethnography, content analysis, longitudinal studies, and experimental and evaluative research. The social survey is defined as a method of social research with three main characteristics. The type of content, the form of the data, and a method of analysis, according to Marsh, 1982. So, its content is social, the form of data is systematic, structured, and based around wearables, and the method of analysis relies on comparing between groups. In this survey, it's most commonly performed by asking people questions through what is called questionnaires. So survey would be the research design, the overall plan, and the actual tool would be the questionnaire, where you could have a closed-ended questionnaire or an open-ended questionnaire. A closed-ended questionnaire means we limit the options. It's like a multiple-choice test, whereby you ask a question and there are responses, for example, A, B, C. In an open-ended questionnaire, you leave a blank space and people can elaborate to their heart's content. The other type of survey would be the face-to-face -face interview. So an interview is also a type of survey where you get a large um, sampling of people's opinions, but you can do that also by speaking to them in a face-to-face -face interview. So when doing a survey, it usually covers a wide range of people. We can't possibly study the entire population which means everybody that lives in a particular society. So what we have to do instead is select a representative amount of people or respondents that live within that population, which would be what we call sampling. So there are a few types of sampling. For example, probability sampling, simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, and non-probability sampling are a few examples. Just to give you a brief definition of a few types of sampling. We have probability sampling which allows the chance of an element being selected to be quantified or ideally equal. Probability sampling strategies through statistical procedures allow estimates of sampling error to be calculated. And we also have simple random sampling where a commonly used procedure is to assign a number to each element in the sampling frame and use an unbiased process to select elements from the sampling frame. For example, we try to use a random number generator. Next, we have systematic random sampling where we usually have a list of population elements. There are certain characteristics we're looking for. So, we identify a starting point randomly and then we use a sampling interval to select elements. So these intervals are calculated by dividing the desired sample size by the number of elements in the sampling frame. Another common example would be stratified sampling, where we use groups to achieve representation or representativeness to ensure that a certain number of elements from each group are selected. For example, based on age, gender, um, ethnicity, and so on. Next up, we have the research design known as ethnography. This is a research design which we commonly hear uh, to be used by sociologists and also anthropologists. So this is really a product of a combination of methodologies that share the assumption that personal engagement with the subject is the key to understanding a particular culture or social setting. So within this major research design, we could also have interviews, conversational and discourse analysis, documentary analysis, film, photography, life histories. Because really, this is all about the interpretivist point of view, as we covered earlier. And then like survey, which is rather positivist in trying to gather something which we can easily quote, and classify, the ethnographic method actually relies on trying to put oneself in the social actor's shoes. Therefore, we use a combination of methods within this major research design 
to try and capture all the nuances of a person's life. Moving on, next we have content analysis, yet another research design. So this is defined as a method of analyzing the contents of documents. So we could use um, calculation to calculate the frequency of words, for example. And we can then classify these thematically. For example, in a study of how gender is depicted in novels, one could count perhaps how many times the name of female characters appear in a particular piece of fiction. So for example, you could use a quantitative method or measure to count the frequency of appearance of particular elements in the text. So what's special about content analysis was that it started out being a method commonly used to study the contents of newspapers during the 1940s, so very much closely tied to media studies. And then we have the type of study known as a longitudinal study. So a longitudinal study basically is a type of research that studies cohorts of people across a long period of time, maybe several decades. For example, we know that there was um, a pandemic back in 1918, and now we have one in 2020 and ongoing. So we might want to study the changes in people's attitudes over the decades from 1918 up to now. That could be one example. So basically, any social or developmental research involving collection of data from the same individuals or the same groups or in a particular location across time would be called a longitudinal study. Some common examples could also include uh, studying the effect of treatments, whether based on medical or psychological treatments, upon a certain group of individuals over a few decades. And of course, we have the very famous experimental and evaluative research designs, which really include experiments. So basically what we're covering here is the whole spectrum of major research designs, although experiments are not so common in sociology. They are used sometimes in psychology to test the effect of a certain treatment or a certain kind of test upon individuals. We may have heard of some famous um, psychological experiments like the Stanford study or the Milgram study, the Stanford experiment, the prison experiment where individuals were recruited to either play the role of prisoner or warden. They were actually undergraduate students and they were told to either role play as a prisoner or a warden. And they were actually supposed to build real makeshift prisons in the basement of the university's laboratory. And the effect, uh, the intention was to see what would the effect be upon these individuals when the whole prison experiment ended. So it's not a method commonly used in sociology because we tend to favor studying individuals in their own immediate community, their own natural community, so to speak, without any additional dependent variables or independent variables. This is, however, to give you a good idea of all the different types of major research designs that exist out there that could be used across a variety of social sciences. So now let's look at the strengths or weaknesses of primary research designs and their methods. So first of all, we have the structured interview or questionnaires, uh, which of course fall under the survey method. So this would be the most popular method in sociological research. The reason for that is because it's easy to code, especially if you have a close-ended survey questionnaire where you ask multiple choice questions. Very easy for you to quantify, tabulate and code the answers. For example, how many respondents agreed or disagreed or were neutral. And also, if you were to do an interview, interviewees would be asked identical questions in exactly the same way. So it's standardized and not biased. So you can obtain a lot of answers from a lot of people in a fast and cheap way. Especially when you have online surveys now, it's even easier. Google Forms, for example, is free. However, there are also some weaknesses associated with structured interviews and questionnaires, where if you were to do an interview, um, the personality of the interviewer could have an effect upon the respondent. 
So perhaps the way we ask questions to our respondents, our personalities as researchers, maybe our education level, our gender, our age, our tone of voice could affect the way people respond to us. And if we do a close-ended answer option, although it will be more objective, it's also difficult for us to get deeper or descriptive meanings because it's limited. So people cannot elaborate further. Or if there's no option that corresponds to their own experience, they can't tell us what um, the experience is. So therefore, it lacks ecological validity, as what we talk about in the first part of this lecture. It's not really that applicable to all situations. Now, what we also have is another type of interview called the unstructured interview. This may fall under ethnography as a research design, where we have to also talk to the people that we are observing in participant observation, which also falls under ethnography. So, for example, we could conduct a visit to a village and we'll have to learn maybe their language, we have to observe their customs and traditions, we have to live with them, and we also have to speak to them, obviously, to get them to explain the meanings behind their actions. So again, like Weber's Verstehen. So it's more like ordinary conversations. There is no fixed interview structure. Perhaps in your mind you have certain ideas that you want to discuss with them, and you may just have it embedded in your mind, but you don't really ask them a list of questions. So it's most commonly used in ethnographic research, and it has to depend upon the rapport or the relationship that you are able to establish with your respondent. So again, this could also um, have the interviewer effect where your personality might affect the way people respond to you. So the benefit is it has more depth and flexibility than the structured interview. It's more valid because subjects can express their experience as much as they want to, without limitations. But this also leads to the limitation where the answers will be very difficult to quote because you have some people who talk a lot and some people who talk very little. And it's easier for you to quote the ones where the answers are short, but they are not so rich in detail. But the really long answers will be difficult for you to quote and you have to find themes within it. So thankfully nowadays you have softwares like Envivo or other kinds of qualitative data mining software where they can find patterns. That's why a lot of researchers use these. So the other limitations is that, as mentioned, it might also have an interviewer effect and the data will be less reliable because there's no way you could reproduce the exact same responses if you were to repeat the same research again. Then we have observational methods, also falling under ethnography in a way. That's why we call it participant observation because we observe, but we don't just stand there in a passive way, we also participate. Like if there, if there were to be a festival, we would also participate in the customs and traditions to better understand the meanings behind actions ourselves. So, but under the whole umbrella of observational methods, we could also classify experiments under it. So that would be a kind of structured observation. And of course, we have unstructured participant observation, or a semi-structured one, where we do something called triangulation. Perhaps we start off with a survey, then we follow up with unstructured interviews or participant observation. The purpose of this is to basically confirm whether the data that we got earlier from the survey is valid and to also enable people to elaborate further about the meanings behind their actions. Then you also have the more official type of statistics and also documents which can be used for content analysis. So official statistics refers to the mass of data collected by the state and its various agencies like a census. Sometimes the classifications in there can be not so standardized or not so valid and this depends on the way indicators are interpreted. If you recall in part one of this lecture, we talk about defining poverty so sometimes a different researcher will come up with different indicators of poverty. So if you were to repeat this census or this survey over a few years or over a few decades, you may have different uh, outcomes depending on how you define these variables. And then you also have documents in which we can perform content analysis to calculate the frequency of themes or words. You could have official documents, like government reports, company accounts, 
Uh, you could have a, this kind of documents in statistics departments, or it could be cultural documents like newspapers, magazines, television, or even personal documents like letters, diaries, blogs. And in this age of social media, it could even be a big data analysis. For example, the content on Facebook. So finally, what are the factors influencing the research, design, or research method that we choose to use in our projects? So we classify these based on research design, typical subjects or respondents, and typical methods. So in a survey, typically we study samples of large populations, like maybe the whole state, the whole country, or the whole university. So we tend to use a structured interview questionnaire as the actual tool or method. The next research design would be experimental or evaluative. This tends to study small groups of subjects. Like in a lab experiment, you tend to have a very small amount of people at any given time. So the associated method would be a structured observation. And then you have a comparative or cross-cultural type of research design, where you tend to compare across institutions, societies, or groups of societies. For example, the education system in one country compared to another country. And this tends to rely on official statistics or documents, as mentioned a while ago. And you have ethnographic type of research design, which tends to look at case studies, which are basically, in a way, unique or isolated. And so the typical methods would be participant observation, where you both observe and participate, and you follow up with an unstructured interview. Maybe also looking at personal documents. For example, if it's a historical type of research, you may want to cross-check whether what your respondents say fit in with historical archive documents. 